Would you actually hire someone who's a climate change denier? No. We simply don't have time to be part of the convincing. A no-nonsense answer on a no-nonsense issue. For the IKEA chief executive, Jesper Broden, every second counts. As the head of a $40 billion a year business that generates 0.1% of all global greenhouse emissions, Broden feels and embraces the environmental responsibility that's on his shoulders. The bigger the company, the bigger the brand, the more you need to be in the lead. That makes sense because we need to scale the good development of the climate work. And so I think for us to assume that responsibility has been uh, number one. Broden has been taking steps to tackle climate change for years. Now, as consumers grow increasingly conscious of the potentially catastrophic consequences of not acting, he has a warning for businesses who've been slow on the uptake. I think this is the moment where if you decide to tactically refrain from acting, I think you will be in trouble. Joining me on this Leaders with Lacroix Goes Green is IKEA Chief Executive Jesper Brook. Jesper, thank you so much on joining us for Leaders with LACWA. Talk to me a little bit about how you started. So you've been at IKEA for 25 years. You've been chief executive since 2018. How has that shaped the chief executive that you've become, the leader you've become? Well, it's been a journey. 25 years, um, some days I can't believe it, but it's been um, like an adventure and an opportunity for myself to both, I think, explore uh, the world and explore my, myself from a leadership perspective. Um, obviously, when I started, I didn't have a master plan to, to end up where I am today. Um, but it was an adventure and an opportunity to uh, test something that turned out to be, be actually more inspiring and more challenging than I thought from the beginning. And, and you started out as a purchasing manager in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. the, was that the first time you really got to understand and look at the supply chain? Well, actually, previously, to, before I joined IKEA, I, I worked with setting up um, uh, supply in, um, in hotels, in Best Western chain in, in uh, Sweden. So I had a bit of experience, and I, I guess that m somehow made me qualified for this position. Uh, I find, uh, found out, though, um, uh, these were the days, by the way, in, in Karachi, in Pakistan, that was quite turbulent. Uh, so I found out um, I was actually the only one who applied for the job, they told me afterwards. So I'm not sure if it's true or not, but uh, this is my entry point to IKEA. Did, did you have an emotional attachment to IKEA because you grew up with IKEA furniture? I, th I think so. IKEA was part of my childhood and part of our home. Um, and I'm also interested. I have a background uh, uh, from my father's side uh, on design, art. Uh, so I, I like the, um, you know, the, the, the whole design aspect of uh, home furnishing was appealing to me. Do you remember the first conversation on sustainability when you were working for at IKEA? What prompted it? Was it a change in yourself or a change in the founder's vision? Well, I, I would say the first time it, uh, it really hit me, it was uh, a, a massive dilemma being actually in Pakistan so many years ago. And that was the, um, the aspect that I think um, of, uh, are we as a company responsible only for the four walls in our stores and and such, or actually do we take a moral and ethical responsibility for our entire value chain, also the, the people that we trade uh, from. And in the end of the day, we came to the conclusion that we have to be responsible for, for um, uh, all activities. That is basically an outcome of what we do. And being in Pakistan, being one of the front runners in developing what became our code of uh, conduct, uh, it took us 10 years actually to implement it, uh, including quite strict measures, both on the environmental side and on the people side, working hours, uh, et cetera, salaries, uh, uh, environmental aspect of production and so forth. Uh, and that was, I would say, the first time I was really confronted with that you, you need to make choices. But do you remember at the time, what were the, some of the conversations? Was it about you know purpose and profit and whether they go hand in hand? Absolutely. Did, were you ready to pay more, I guess, to have a more sustainable supply chain? Well, it, that was actually one of the biggest fears uh, then. And then I think there were all sorts of also moral uh, uh, questions that were debated. This was not an easy uh, decision for us. Uh, uh, and I was, of course, a junior observing some of the conversation, partaking in them. But I think looking back at hindsight, the, the mistake uh, uh, or the, the mistaken perspective that was there, which still exists today, and it's a bit of um, a dangerous one, is that people assume that this should come at the premium when it's actually the opposite. Uh, since we implemented our code of conduct, we have lowered our prices, we have uh, improved quality, 
uh, and at the same time ensure that we do things right in the value chain. The biggest learning for me and for us has been that uh, working with what you could call people and plan a positive aspect is, is actually absolutely a part of the economy that we are building. How, how close were you to the founder? I mean, the, the story of Ikea and how he founded it is absolutely amazing. Was he also the one that kind of pushed for this long-term plan? Well, I think I had the opportunity to work as, uh, as personal assistant uh, to Ingvar uh, for uh, three years. So uh, we got to know each other quite well. And I had the pleasure to learn from him, uh, which was, of course, an incredible opportunity for my own development. Uh, Ingvar was uh, real, I think. Uh, to the point that he came to a point in his life in early in his 30s something when he was you know he made it uh, financially and his business model was a success where he made uh, choices so if, if for him ikea became more important than his own fortune if you like uh, so he was passionate until his last days on actually working to support uh, the many people within wallets and that i think he left an, a lovely legacy uh, for us to take care of is it true, uh, Jasper, that at some point you said, you know, what's the long-term plan or what's longer term for you? And the founder said it must be 200 years or even more. <laughs> yeah, he surprised me a little bit there. I would have accepted <laughs> 20 years or something. But, you know, he, I think he had, um, for him, obviously, progress was important. But also independence was a very strong value with him. So if you look at IKEA as a corporate uh, and a financial construction today, uh, we are very low on loans, uh, almost no debt. We are very rich on assets. And Ingvar always told us we have time to get to where we need to go. Uh, but the reason we are a foundation-based uh, uh, corporation today is that Ingvar thought the independence for us to make our choices uh, in a long-term perspective were more important than maybe the, the fast pace of expansion, for example. Up next, IKEA wants to be climate positive by 2030. But what exactly does that mean? How can it be achieved? And just why are companies taking the issue more and more seriously? With all the facts that we have today, um, obviously we as leaders need to take our responsibility. It's about the moral and ethical uh, choices in the end of the day. We simply can't continue to, to, to do what we used to do in the 1900s. It's hard to comprehend just how big IKEA is. The chain has 445 outlets across the world. The average size of their stores is 300,000 square feet. The company employs more than 210,000 people and more than 200 million copies of the IKEA catalog are published annually, making it the world's most distributed book each year. As a result, IKEA produces a tenth of 1% of all global greenhouse emissions. But Chief Executive Jasper Broden insists that when you're so large, the difference you can make is also enormous. He spoke to me about the changes the company is making, his responsibility as a chief executive, and why going green is good for business and not just the environment. You want to be climate positive. You want IKEA to be climate positive by 2030. What exactly does that mean? Well, the world needs to be climate positive. Uh, th this is something that I think uh, all of us need to understand that there is basically no other plan for us uh, than being uh, climate positive together. Uh, for us, the uh, commitment to Paris, the 1.5 degree actually in Paris, is actually not only the right ethical thing to do, not only what co-workers and customers expect us to do, but it is the way that we can uh, exist tomorrow and serve people within wallets because everything else will become ultimately too expensive. I, I think you, you were um, you know, responsible for 0.1% of all global emissions. Do you remember that pivot when you said, actually, we as a company need to lead to do more to also show other big companies what they can do to be climate leaders? I think, I think, we're, I think it's good to assume both responsibilities. Obviously, every, uh, every country, every corporation, I would say the bigger the company, the bigger the brand, the more more you need to be in the lead. That makes sense because we need to scale uh, the good uh, uh, development of the, of the climate work. Um, so I think for us to assume that responsibility has been uh, number one. Secondly, we are discovering also obviously that by collaborating with others, which we need in many aspects, and by influencing each other, we have an opportunity to speed up the market conditions that we are striving towards.
I know when you look at and talk about climate positive, there's scope one, two, and three. Scope three means that a company also takes responsibility for the clients and the customers driving to an IKEA store. How much responsibility do chief executives need to take for the holistic, for the recycling, for, for the, the whole, mm -hmm. not only how you produce, but then what comes after for these products? Very good. I would say, first of all, I think I find it fascinating. And I'm, you know, trying to educate myself because typically, a person in my shoes would have some economic background, some business, core business background and leadership. Uh, but we all need to be uh, become experts in the cockpit of what climate work looks like. Now, as you refer to the, the scopes here, scope one is your own emissions, scope two is what you buy in energy to simplify it, and scope three is everything. Um, a lot of companies look at scope three as an incredible challenge, <clears throat> but I, which it is uh, fundamentally. But it's also, I think, in scope three lies a lot of the great opportunities. So in our case, by extending our responsibility to raw material, which is, by the way, uh, by far the, the, the biggest part of our uh, carbon footprint, yeah. and then extending it all the way, not only to the interaction with customers in transport, but also the life uh, at home usage of our kitchens, for example, kitchen appliances, and the end of life, by addressing those aspects, we are uh, capable to do the right thing. Yes, but it's very clear that for a lot of people, mass production and you know, you sell on such a massive scale doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with sustainability. And you've always pushed back against that. Yes. Why? Well, I, I think um, you know th this is actually quite logic, and I think there are some myths out there that is not helping us. And one is that uh, mass production would be uh, uh, something that would be contrary to the journey, but it's actually the opposite. So. The, if you would play with the opposite angle, that small scale solution would be the solution uh, for resolving climate change, then that would at least take an enormous amount of time. And if you take the opposite um, in, in, at IKEA and other great companies, we, we have the opportunity to scale innovation, to replace materials, uh, to, to uh, implement, um, for instance, a few years ago, we decided to take out the wooden pallet in IKEA and replace it with a thin uh, paper pallet. It mm -hmm. might uh, sound like a small uh, endeavor, but it was huge. So we have done that across uh, uh, suppliers all the way to customers. And by that, taking out a lot of unnecessary air being transported. This is uh, one example out of many on how you actually scale the new smart uh, climate friendly solutions. Is there a danger that if you make things too cheap, people will discard them? So how do you think about the longevity of a product that you sell? Which is, I would say, also the, the second myth is about consumption. Um, obviously, uh, we need to make sure that we, uh, that we change the, the, the view on consumption and the, the actually the way we uh, all uh, partake in consumption going forward. But no consumption is not an option for humanity. Um, if you look at, for, for instance, you can look at mattresses, which is one of the bulky, heavier, and climate-heavy uh, also uh, parts of IKEA's footprint. Um, so if you believe that people would not sleep uh, tomorrow, that would then <laughs> be the easy solution. But how do you provide beds and quality mattresses and good sleeping quality for people in a way that is uh, in harmony with climate? And as part of that, in that uh, particular uh, um, value chain, circularity becomes a fundamental yeah. criteria. Uh, today, for instance, IKEA is investing in new setups and structures. We started in Netherlands, and now we're actually taking back more than half of the whole nation and the waste of mattresses and making new mattresses and raw material out of it. So circularity is part of the new consumption we are defining. So I don't know the life cycle of an IKEA mattress, but are, are you trying to make sure that people keep those mattresses for longer or are you making the second generation of mattresses from old mattresses? So this is the circularity that you're talking about. Yeah, yes, to, to all the, the above. I think for us, it starts with that we have redefined design principles for all products. For instance, to make sure that all products are uh, possible to separate, material is possible to separate. Before, in different uh, production categories, it would be difficult to separate metal and plastic and, and such. Uh, so how do you design products in a way so you enable uh, circularity is, uh, is, you can say, principle number two. Uh, principle number one. Principle number two would be quality and durability. And for us, that means also uh, engineering new type of fittings that makes it possible for us to actually uh, enable secondhand market. And then all the way until you come to a place and a time where the product is, is void. Um, how do you then bring back, when it's relevant, which it will be in so many places, how do you bring back the material and make sure you create a new economy? 
interesting enough, some of the lower prices that we see now is built on those uh, value chains. What was the first uh, revolutionary thing you did? Was it LED lights? And how have the conversations changed? Was that a really difficult conversation? <laughs> like, how, how does it happen? Oh, does someone yeah. have the idea and people say, no, 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 we can't do that. And then you push them and it gets done? I would say the LED decision was, uh, to be honest, that was uh, a bit of a leap of faith. Because at the moment when the decision was make, made, it looked really bad from a business perspective. So we simply didn't because have- Because it was more quality. expensive. Exactly. I think uh, by that time, I think we could be produce a LED bulb for say around 20 euro or thereabouts. Um, and we knew that uh, demand would be uh, totally hampered by that type of price level. Today we are down uh, far below um, one euro and both technology and the scale we put behind it uh, made that possible. So there we, we, we took a bet and <clears throat> as always when you take a bet you can of course lose but we were early on and I think we were the first company out there who went 100% LED and it's turned out to be an amazing business opportunity for us. Why do you have all these climate change commitments? Is it you, I know you're a sailor, is it because it makes business sense or is it some attachment to nature, almost personal attachment? I would say, I'd say it's, um, it's truly a three a very important factors and it's almost like at this time I, I, I consider each one of them to be a strong uh, enough uh, reason uh, and, and uh, to start with as we have spoken to here we are believers that the new economy where everybody needs to be part of the new economy and we don't believe in solutions where there will be a premium for people because that will lead to all sorts of social and political uh, headaches and we don't really see the reason so the first reason would be that we are defining the new supply, supply chains that will be more cost effective than the old ones so climate positive in that sense is also economically positive yeah. secondly there is a, it's not a linear uh, development anymore, or it's uh, basically um, a logarithmic development of people out there in all markets where we exist, who expect us to be good at this, expect us to be a leader. Um, it also comes down to if you want to recruit the most, uh, uh, the most uh, advanced uh, talents, then you need to be a good company. Now, the third reason is with all the facts that we have today, um, Obviously, we as leaders need to take a responsibility. It's about the moral and ethical uh, choices in the end of the day. We simply can't continue to, to, to do what we used to do in the 1900s. Up next, there are still plenty of climate change deniers out there, but Jesper Broden doesn't plan on hiring them. We simply don't have time to be part of the convincing. Uh, the time is uh, uh, ticking here. We think the coming decade is the decade where we need to put solutions in place. And I find sometimes uh, some of the discussions might uh, take away a little bit of your time and focus from going to action. And it's only in actions that we're gonna make a difference anyways. Although the green agenda has gathered massive momentum in recent years, there are still those who don't believe. But if they're looking for a job at IKEA, they might be out of luck, according to the chief executive, Jesper Broden. Would you actually hire someone who's a climate change denier? No. Is it one of the questions? That, no, that you I, I have never got that question before. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I think, um, uh, you know what I think, uh, why I answer no to that question is obviously, it's a big world out there. There are people who are uh, convinced there are people also who have a strong uh, um, a different opinion on this uh, and I think we simply don't have time to be part of the convincing uh, the time is uh, uh, ticking here we think the coming decade is the decade where we need to put solutions in place and I find sometimes uh, some of the discussions might uh, take away a little bit of your time and focus from going to action and it's only in actions that we're going to make a difference anyways so that's rather where I place myself what kind of advice would you give to a chief executive that has maybe been behind the curve that wants to do good but doesn't know where to start? Well, you know, to start with, I think it's um, important to start to uh, uh, consider being one of the last companies in your business on the platform when the train has left is probably not a good place to be, neither from a brand perspective or the cost benefits and the business benefits. So, so I think uh, uh, timing is probably now in, in all businesses. Uh, I think uh, my second advice would be there, there has to probably be a bit of a leap of faith here, because if you want to have all the answers, 
time time will not allow us, uh, uh, and it will slow us down too much. Uh, and finally, I think uh, uh, it's uh, this is going to be about collaboration. IKEA is too small. Uh, we, we are big enough to change some things, but we are too small to change the infrastructures of the world. And therefore, companies need to work together. Uh, competitors need to reach out. Uh, we need to, together with governments, define the new principles of the new economy we want to see. And we are in a hurry to do that. So I would say join one of the collaborations and networks yeah. out there. Is there anything that you wish that you could do better or faster right now? Uh, many things. As <laughs> always, uh, uh, patience is... Uh, needs to be balanced with, uh, you know, realism of moving big, uh, uh, big uh, chains. But I, I would say um, incentivizing investments in uh, renewable energy, in, um, in uh, electrical mobility, mm -hmm. and in particular, I would say, in supply chains that are built on circularity, together with the support of governments, needs to be sped up. You have a long-term vision, short-term goals. What happens to chief executives that report quarterly? How much, you know, how, how much more difficult is that kind of tension for them? And again, do you have advice for them, or how should they look at this? Well, it's difficult. Um, I, I have the um, different situation being um, owned by a foundation, and we have a very long-term approach, I think. Uh, still, I would say, just like anybody else, we need to perform. We need to present results. Um, I think it goes back to the myth that sustainability would be detrimental to your, your economics. And I would say it's not. It could be a matter of timing and, uh, and cycles. But I would say, if you look at different businesses now, the ones that have not invested or are late into the shift, uh, they are probably the ones that take the biggest risk right now. Who are the green leaders, leaders in general that maybe go into the green space that you admire the most? I would say the people, uh, the leaders that um, made uh, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, the climate agreement in Paris uh, happened. I admire them because uh, at that time we knew even less about the true solution. So political leaders have the power and the guts to actually step up the game and the patience of the negotiations. I think that's amazing. Any regrets? I know you're you know, spearheading a, a lot of the good that can come out of big business, but could you have started it earlier? Well, I think, you know, typically the regrets... Uh, I have, when I look back, is uh, the times we hesitated or didn't know. So it's not so much what we did, but what we waited with or, um, or didn't go for. Uh, obviously, I think the community is such uh, uh, today. If we look at what we know today, and if we place ourselves back 20 years in time, we should have probably, uh, uh, we didn't simply know the uh, logarithmic impact of climate change. Um, there were wake up calls in the uh, early 2000s, uh, the movie from Al Gore and others actually uh, shook up a lot of us as individuals and leaders. So. But it's difficult to go back. So the only way is forward. And therefore, I think for me, the learning is that time is not necessarily a friend in this case. We need to move from uh, discussions into actions. And that's what I've been moving forward. Future generations will look at 2021. And if not enough is done, what will they say? Well, I think, I think. Um, uh, I think this is the moment where if you decide to tactically refrain from acting, I think you will be in trouble with your brand and your leadership tomorrow. If you're outspoken about your uh, di direction and wish without having all the answers, I think people will accept that. So, uh, Because the truth is that we, we don't have a plan for the world yet. There are so many questions to be straightened out. So we need to be a bit more naked and transparent and invite the... Uh, uh, people to, to understand that we're on the way. And hopefully people will appreciate that uh, tomorrow. Jesper Broden, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much.